Good evening, everyone. I'm Susan Fernbach, and along with Dr. Deborah Murray, we are the co-directors of the Office of Community Engagement and Diversity for the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. We welcome you to this Evenings with Genetics webinar tonight, honoring Black History Month, with two webinars on race and genetics, perspectives on precision medicine. Tonight is the first of the two webinars. The second will be on next Tuesday, February 16th. Tonight, we're also celebrating the 15th anniversary of the Evenings with Genetics program, which is a free seminar series for the public. This began as in-person monthly seminars at the Children's Museum of Houston. And our goals are to provide current genetic and genomic information in a clear, plain language manner, to offer support and resources to those impacted by a genetic disorder and to foster collaborations. Due to the ongoing pandemic, the series has moved completely online and we're very pleased to welcome each of you. It is with enormous gratitude that we thank Dr. Brendan Lee, Chair of the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine and also Dr. Art Odette, our former chair, for their support and encouragement for this series, as well as extending a huge thank you to the many faculty and family speakers who've been so generous in sharing their expertise. The series is planned with the Evenings with Genetics Committee, and we'd like to give a special thanks to Dr. Neil Hanchard for his role in planning these February webinars. Due to the ongoing social issues in our country, we felt a need to address old concepts of genetics and race to enable us to move forward with science to help more people in our communities. These two webinars are sponsored not only by the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics, but also the Baylor College of Medicine Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, the Human Genome Sequencing Center and Baylor Genetics Labs. During the webinar, you can enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and those questions will be answered at the end. We have a great evening planned, and welcome our moderator, Dr. Charmaine Royal, and speakers, Dr. Shaniqua Callier and Dr. Clayton Yates. Our moderator, Dr. Royal, is the Professor of African and African American Studies biology, global health, and family medicine and community health at Duke University. She also has appointments in the Duke Initiative for Science and Society and the Keenan Institute for Ethics. Dr. Royal directs the Duke Center on Genomics, Race, Identity, Difference, and the Duke Center for Truth, Healing, and Transformation. Her focus has been on ethical, social, scientific, and clinical implications of genetics and genomics particularly issues at the intersection of gene, genetics and race. Her primary goal is to dismantle ideologies and systems of race and racism in research, healthcare, and society. Dr. Royal obtained her bachelor's degree in microbiology, a master's in genetic counseling, and a doctorate in human genetics from Howard University. She completed her postgraduate training in ethical, legal, and social implications in the research and ethics at the National Human Genome Research Institute for the, at the National Institutes of Health and in epidemiology and behavioral medicine at Howard University Cancer Center. So it's an honor and pleasure to have Dr. Royal as our moderator this evening. And with a warm welcome, I turn it over to you, Charmaine. Thank you so much, Susan. I really appreciate the invitation by you and Deborah to be here and to participate in this webinar this evening um, and, and to participate with, uh, with friends. I know Dr. Collier very, really well um, and we've worked a lot together. So I am just very pleased to be here. Um, we're gonna talk about race and genetics. Race and genetics, perspectives, on precision medicine. These, th this, this webinar brings together um, what I think are two topics that could stand, each could stand on its own, race and genetics and precision medicine. Race and genetics, I mean, we've been talking, we, the scientific 
community, the, the academic community has been talking about race and its links to science for, for more than a century and, and more recent genetics and, and, and what, what the links are or not between race and genetics and genetics and anthropology have shown us over the years that humans do not subdivide into what we call biological races. And, and we, we've said that, we've written it, we've talked about it, but this issue and, and the issues at the intersection of race and genetics continue to come up. And uh, with regard to research, how do we use race as a variable in, rec in research, how we use it in medicine or not, um, issues related to, to, to socially co this socially constructed um, variable that we call, call race. And in more recent, over the last year or so, the issue of race has been front and center in, turn, in our society. Um, and it has really brought the issues of what we, how we think about race in medicine and science, particularly when you see the, what's happening with COVID-19 and the, the disparate um, incidence and prevalence of the disease in certain populations. Um, and populations usually linked to health disparities. And we see these differences and the questions about what is causing these differences? Is it genetic? Is it society? Is it environment? Is it, what, what is it? And how do we parse these, these things? And so our research, um, biomedical research, social science research, um, genetics research um, are still grappling um, with these issues. And along with the issue of race, is, the, is, is racism that, that, that is intertwined with ideologies and ideas of race. So there are many issues, social issues, scientific issues that, that, that arise when we think about um, the, the relationships between race and genetics and, and the general public, um, many in the public are, are confused about how these things are related or not, but I don't want the public to feel that they're, they're the only ones confused Many in the academic community and the scientific community are still trying to figure out how do we deal with, with, with these issues. Precision medicine. Um, for some people, precision medicine is a new term that they probably only heard about in the last five or so years when, when, when the US Precision Medicine Initiative was launched um, um, by President Obama, former President Obama. And, and this term precision medicine has been circulating and that too, like race and genetics and the links between them, as, as raises a lot of issues. Some people are not sure how to define precision medicine. And our speakers may talk a bit about that, about, about the confusion about what precision medicine is or the different perspectives on what precision medicine is and, and, and how the, this initiative to accelerate the development of tools and, and therapies and, and knowledge and treatments for for diseases, um, to, to move the agendas for health, how we understand health and how we, we do research and how we, we practice medicine. Um, precision medicine offers a, a new way of thinking about health in terms of bringing together um, genetics and genomic sciences, but also the social and the behavioral and the environmental sciences. Um, that's how it's, the, 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 it's perceived and conceptualized. Um, in terms of the initiative. But again, people have different thoughts about what precision medicine is. And so the issues, the ethical issues, the scientific issues, the social issues that genetics and race um, raise and precision race, we're gonna bring them all together today. And we have two well-qualified speakers to help us think deeply about these topics separately, but how they come, come together. And I'm gonna introduce both of them and then they're gonna speak consecutively. And then after they speak, we're gonna have our question and answer section, session, all right? So our first speaker is Dr. Shaniqua Collier. She's an associate professor in the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Professor Collier teaches courses in bioethics and healthcare law in a variety of programs. Um, in that program, in, 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 in this, the, the, the School of Medicine and Health, and Health Sciences. She's also a special volunteer at the Center for Research on Genomics and Global Health at the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH. 
Her research focuses on issues at the intersection of bioethics, law, and emerging technologies. Our next speaker will be Dr. Clayton Yates. He's a professor in the Department of Biology and the Center for Cancer Research, as well as director of the Center for Biomedical Research at Tuskegee University. He's also adjunct faculty in the Department of Biology at Clark Atlanta University and the Department of Pathology at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Dr. Yates's research interest is in genomic and epigenetic alterations that contribute to aggressive cancers, particularly breast and prostate cancer in African-Americans. He's received numerous research honors and awards and grants and has, has authored over 80 published, peer reviewed published publications. Before I say anything more, I'll ask Dr. Shanika Collier to speak. Good afternoon. I think I can share my slides. Let's make sure I share the right ones. Can you see this? Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. And everyone can hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Put it in presentation mode, Shani. Sure. So from the beginning. Okay. Are they, are they, um, am, am I moving forward as well? Okay. <laughs> All right. Great. So first, um, good evening. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful event with my esteemed friends and colleagues. Uh, the title of my talk is Precision Medicine Research Ethics, Going Beyond Equitable Participation. It speaks directly to the themes of tonight, race, racism, racial categories, the roles of genetics and other factors in precision medicine. And I'm going to speak about both genetics and bioethics. And I'd like us to discuss moving beyond equitable participation using a bioethics lens. And um, I'm arguing that the success of precision medicine for all people, um, as well as the field I focus more, and I'll be talking more about genomics, requires deeper engagement with the bioethical principle of justice beyond even inclusion. I have no uh, financial or other conflicts of interest. The opinions expressed are my own and should not be construed as the views of my affiliate institutions. Uh, this presentation is based on my work and my scholarship. So um, first I want to start by defining uh, bioethics, ELSI, which stands for the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomics and even provide a short, a brief and quick history of bioethics, because I just want to highlight, illuminate that the notion of ethics has been around for a long time, but we have yet to grapple with race and the use of race in research and medicine, as well as racism. And that's true for ELSI as well as bioethics. And then I will discuss other issues that are important going beyond even uh, the genomics field has spent a great deal of time thinking about the problems and the challenges of eugenics um, recruitment. But what about the rac racial categories, how we define and talk about populations? What about our funding priorities, diversity and leadership? We need to address these issues, I think, for precision medicine to be successful. So LC, the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomics. Again, I think this slide captures the essence of concerns about genomics in society. The Human Genome Project took place from 1990 to 2003. And again, I'm not assuming that everyone on the call knows all of this already. I know we have a diverse audience tonight. Um, and of course, it says, of course, solving the genetic code is just the beginning. The LC program ran concurrently with the Human Genome Project, and it was designed to address these issues, to address the social issues that can arise by peering into the human genome. Uh, bioethics, as defined by this scholar, Dr. Albert Johnson, is a systematic study of the moral dimensions involving moral visions, decisions, con the conduct, and policies. It involves life sciences, healthcare, and employing a variety of ethical methodologies in an interdisciplinary setting. Um, 
Johnson asserts that bioethics scholars, he says, appeared on the scene in the late 1960s. Um, it's an interdisciplinary field. So scholars from diverse disciplines, history, anthropology, medicine, physicians, um, engage in bioethics. They did in the 60s and they do today. But the concept of medical ethics has been around for a long time. The American Medical Association published a code of medical medical ethics in 1847. Uh, medical ethics at the time was informed by philosophical traditions, religion, some legal precedent, and, and various moral rules going back over 2,000 years. Uh, medical ethics today, we think of it, um, and many people define ethics differently, but we think of medical ethics as involving four main principles, and uh, Beecham and Childress published one of the most prominent and important works in biomedical ethics. The principles are the respect for autonomy, the principle of non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice, and I'm going to spend some time today on justice. We also had international codes. Um, international guidelines addressed the treatment of patients and research participants. One of the most famous guidelines that I'm sure many of you have heard of is the Nuremberg Code, which was published in 1947. There were others as well. These are just a few examples. And I, I wanted to show how far they date back. 1948 for the Declaration of Geneva, which emphasized um, that physicians, it insisted that physicians must practice medicine with conscience and dignity. The Declaration of Helsinki, adopted in 1964, also applies to physicians. The well-being of the human subject should take precedence over the interest of science and society. And you'll notice that even though many guidelines refer to participants in research as human subjects, I prefer to refer to them as human participants. So we had these guidelines. Um, we've had discussions about medical ethics. And yet, in 1966, Henry Beecher published what was called a bombshell in medical ethics, detailing 22 cases of research abuse involving vulnerable populations. The publication of this paper reinforced the need for ethics to protect participants against the risks of research. However, there were many in the medical field who were outraged with this publication and Beecher's uh, detailing of these abuses because they didn't consider themselves um, as unethical or needing any type of special code for research in the United States. This had implications for many different populations. The population uh, I spend most of my time thinking about and working on um, are Black and African American populations. And so the United States Public Health Study at Tuskegee took place from 1932 to 1972, and it stands out in the face of all of these guidelines and discussions that I, I know I quickly and briefly went over about medical ethics. It was one of the most notorious cases of research abuse, and it is often cited as one of the most uh, memor memorable reasons as to why African-Americans declined to participate in research at much higher rates, including genomics research. Um, many of you might have heard of medical apartheid. This um, history of mistrust, the book explains, extends back far farther than the syphilis study and, and more broadly. Um, the, the author, Harriet Washington, explains that researchers who exploit African-Americans or exploited African-Americans were the norm for much of the nation's history when black patients were commonly regarded as, and I'm quoting here, as fit subjects for non-consensual, non-therapeutic research. And, and she details many egregious cases of abuses involving Africans and African-Americans before and after, after slavery. Uh, Dr. Vanessa Gamble, a medical physician and historian has, has challenged us to think beyond Tuskegee um, and to think about the history that goes further back than Tuskegee when thinking about why there is mistrust. 
And she says that we must examine the long and critical history of research abuses that predate the public health service study. As she wrote in 1997, a single historical event does not explain deeply entrenched and complex attitudes within the black community. After the syphilis study, Congress passed the National Research Act, which established the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research and produced the Belmont Report. And the Belmont Report requires federally funded researchers, um, they require that their protocols be reviewed by an institutional review board and to demonstrate that the principles of respect for persons, beneficence and justice are honored. Um, and the researchers can do this in, in ways such as obtaining informed consent, assessing the risks and benefits of research and also, um, ensuring the equitable selection of subjects. And so the principle of justice requires that fair procedures are in place when selecting research participants. And the Belmont report says that no investigator should offer potentially beneficial research only to some patients who are in their favor or select only undesirable persons for risky research. Um, so these guidelines were produced largely in reaction to the horrific research abuses that occurred before the National Research Act. And autonomy and informed consent are heavily researched topics by the bioethics community and by LC scholars. An area that I'm working on um, now that we have some background um, is diversity and inclusion in research. Um, and what's important is not just uh, participants, but the research questions. Who gets to ask the research questions? What are the research questions? And these are issues relevant to bioethics, LC, and genomics, and ultimately precision medicine. In addition, I'm going to argue that we need to develop frameworks for assessing the roles of race in precision medicine research without also reifying biological notions of race. So we have guidelines. We know that diversity and inclusion is important, but what more do we need for there to be justice in precision medicine? So um, in 2018, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine published a report, Understanding Disparities in Access to Genomic Medicine. And in the report, they talked about building an evidence base that demonstrates the positive effects of genomics and precision medicine on health outcomes. And that we have to have a genomics base and an evidence base if we are going to establish and use genetic technologies. Um, this assertion, is based on an optimistic view that precision medicine research will one day benefit all communities, including, and these communities are discussed in the report, community hospitals and underserved community clinics. Scientists are legitimately concerned, and, and I am concerned as well, that if we don't have diversity and inclusion in terms of the samples and the data we collect, in terms of the data, the genomics data that we study, that some people will be left behind. Now, precision medicine goes beyond genomics. Precision medicine is not just about genomics. Precision medicine researchers look at various data points. They look at lifestyle information, biometric information, social factors, um, social and lifestyle choices. And um, some precision medicine researchers might ask for access to your health record. And um, they'll combine this data in order to um, produce a, a data set that takes into account the many different factors that can lead to health outcomes. And so while genomics is a part of precision medicine, it is, not, it is certainly not the only part of precision medicine. In terms of building our evidence base, however, 
especially within the context of genomics, but also within the context of biomedical research in general, genomics has really uh, failed to satisfy the bioethical principle of equitable inclusion. Um, Pope Joy and Fullerton, uh, building on research that was published in 2009, a study that showed that 96% of a certain type of genomic database, which is very important for genomic research, um, genome-wide association databases, or GWAS. Um, GWAS studies were conducted on less than 4% of people of, uh, I'm sorry, 96% uh, of people who have ancestry predominantly from Europe or who might identify as being people of European ancestry. Um, that study was done in 2009. Pope Joy and Fullerton um, redid the study in 2016. They looked at GWAS data and found that that number went down to 81% of people of European ancestry. Yet, when it comes to people of African American, African, Latino, Indigenous populations, the inclusion number was still under 4% for those populations. Um, they also found that there was considerable heterogeneity in how these populations were described. For example, terms such as Black cases or Sub-Saharan cases were often used to describe people of African ancestry. But the most geographically specified and informative descriptions were those used for samples of European ancestry. So this is a problem for many reasons. Um, one is the enduring use of broad population categories or, or what I will call, or not I, but a lot um, investigators, scientific researchers call super categories. These are categories that are, are very broad. An example might be continental, saying that someone is, Afri is of African ancestry because they have majority ancestry from Africa, for example. That would be a continental category. So tonight we're talking about the use of race. And um, one of the challenges related to precision medicine is not only diversity and inclusion, but also how we talk about and describe populations. And as this article explains, there's an enduring assumption that individuals can be neatly placed in categories based on race, as if their genetics will correlate with racial categories. As depicted in figure B here, the frequency of genetic variations may appear at different levels based on geography and also ancestry. It is also important to note that variation between different regions is small and that the lines between these different populations are blurred. And so the authors argue variation within a, within a single region is large and there is no uniform genetic identity within those regions. And so a challenge with racial categories is that they can obscure genetic differences. And when you are looking at a person, you cannot tell um, their genetic makeup. And if we continue to use genetic, I'm sorry, racial categories in research, we risk reifying this notion that race is somehow biological. Uh, the same authors explain in what I think is a helpful image that there is so much ambiguity between races and between racial groups and so much variation within them that two people of European descent may be more genetically similar to an Asian person than they are to each other. And so this was um, a, a depiction or an illustration of a study that I also reference um, at the bottom of the screen. The image represents a case study of genetic variation between these three scientists, Watson, Venter, and Kim. The colored bars represent genes and different colors represent different versions of those genes. The dark brown allele is shared by every person in this image. 
Watson and Venter share another allele, it's bright blue. However, both share two alleles with Kim um, and an allele signifies a genetic variation. Watson shares red and orange with Kim and Venter shares green and magenta. So the image shows that there is more similarity between the Kim, between Kim and Watson and Kim and Venter than there is between Watson and Venter. So earlier I mentioned that broad labels including racial categories, um, can obscure biomedically relevant variation. And if we're not careful with how we use ancestry, um, because ancestry is sometimes conflated with race and ethnicity, then we could similarly um, uh, find ourselves in a situation where ancestry, uh, ancestral categories also conflate and blur um, or obscure genetic diversity within racial groups. And so there needs to be more effort in defining the populations that are included in studies. So this was an article published in 2010 on ancestry and disease in the age of genomics. And um, it was, uh, there was an example about the drug abacavir. And abacavir is a drug that's used to treat HIV. And um, people who have a certain uh, mutation, genetic mutation, um, are at risk of hypersensitivity and possibly even uh, death if they continue to take the drug abacavir. When the FDA originally reviewed some of the research about um, this HLA mutation, they found that in white populations or European Americans, there was a higher likelihood that a person would have the dangerous mutation. And so they originally recommended that all individuals of European ancestry be screened for the allele before receiving the drug. Later, other research, researchers gathered data from other populations and studied the same mutation and found that other populations also have this mutation in high frequencies, Gujarati Indians having it at a much higher frequency than um, the European American population in the United States. What's really interesting about these findings are that people who identify as black have different levels um, or different frequencies of the variations within different ethnic groups, um, according to the, the research and the statistical data. So if you look at someone who is um, Luya, Kenya, that number is 3.3%, but Maasai, Kenya, 13.6 and both would be um, identified as black. Um, in the United States, someone who is Indian American, Chinese American, might, both groups would be classified as Asian. And so I think this um, example provides a good illustration of how we could render diversity within groups invisible or render certain certain ethnic groups invisible or render certain individuals indivis invisible by um, using such broad categories when describing populations. Um, I think this uh, colorful mosaic also provides a helpful illustration because it talks about this article discusses ancestry and challenges. And another challenge um, that we'll have to grapple with is admixture. We do not have enough, um, we need more studies on the role of admixture in health outcomes. And we also need more studies on admixture, admixture in African-American populations. Since African-Americans, for example, have been underrepresented in genetic studies, um, there's still a lot more to be learned about nationwide patterns of diversity 
um, even um, right here in the United States, as well as globally. Um, this is especially the case globally. Um, but this illustration denotes global population diversity. Uh, the individual people and this pedigree chart represent the complex diversity of recent ancestors. And as the authors explain, the arrows symbolize the migration of human ancestors out of Africa. And even one's ancestry can be imprecisely defined or um, a person's ancestral category can uh, fail to account for genetic admixture. And so admixture, which means that um, there a person has diverse genetic lineage and all of us have a level of um, admixture, especially those of us living in countries like the United States, um, there needs to be more research to understand genetic admixture. And the more we focus on, if we focus on comparing populations based on racial categories or broad ancestral categories, we risk not discussing uh, these other important scientific questions. In addition, it won't prepare us for the future. Um, in the United States, uh, it was reported that in 2020, more than half of the nation's children are expected to be part of a minority race or an ethnic, a US ethnic group, according to the Census Bureau. Um, it, uh, we, are, we are dynamic as populations, constantly changing, and um, people are increasingly identifying with more than one group um, racial or ethnic group, as well as other types of groups or intersectional people. And so it's important that we are prepared for the future of diversity in a place uh, like the United States. So finally, what about frameworks to help us assess the role of race without reifying biological notions? Um, some of you might have seen uh, this article published by Udell and colleagues in 2016, where the authors argued that the use of race as a biological category has actually increased in the post-genomic age. And the authors argue that the use of biological concepts um, of race in human genetics research is disputed and mired in confusion. It's problematic and also harmful. Precision medicine, however, uh, Dr. Royal mentioned President Barack Obama's announcement of precision medicine. Uh, during the State of the Union address in 2016, Barack Obama said the promise of precision medicine is delivering the right treatment at the right time, every time, to the right person. And so if I were to imagine a future of precision medicine, one that considers justice, I would expect there to be sufficient information, um, lifestyle information, genetic information, biometric information, whatever information we need to provide the care we need to participants, and that there would be the capability on the part of the workforce to tailor disease diagnoses, medical decision-making and treatment to all patients, including underserved patients. Participate, participants would be engaged and they would report good experience with medical and research systems. And um, participants might even feel empowered uh, as precision medicine research participants. Um, but this means, and, and now I'm turning back to justice, that there is still more work that will need to be done. Uh, Johnson, Al Albert Johnson also stated in his book that justice is the neglected sibling among the principles of bioethics always acknowledged but seldom given significant tasks or much praise. Patricia King wrote that justice may require more than securing greater inclusion of women, minorities, and other groups in research to derive the benefits from research. And so one thing, one factor we may consider is that the experiences of research participants um, are inextric inextricably linked with their medical experiences, and also that we need to improve trustworthiness in the medical system in order to um, 
not just require that individuals uh, become more trusting, that there's more trust on the part of uh, our researchers and our institutions. And I think I've run out of time, but some issues I could come back to during the discussion have to do with um, new thinking about bioethics, new publications. Um, there's a discussion now about the lens of black bioethics going beyond informed consent and beneficence and actually thinking of the experiences of women in the healthcare system or individuals in the healthcare system who, who are grappling with racism. And the author, uh, Dr. Ray, um, talks about women who may feel as if they can't speak up during the medical encounter and how this lens which emphasizes how women can feel silenced and black women can feel silenced during medical care takes away their ability to provide autonomous decision making. Um, Bonham and Green published an article re recently about improving the genomics workforce, improving diversity in the workforce and ensuring that we have training opportunities and, and uh, pipeline programs. Um, another article was published about the disparity in terms of topics that are published, where um, topics related to health disparities and preventative um, care and are less likely to be funded than topics um, about cell biology, for example. So what can we do in bioethics and in ELSI to better fund these diverse topics and to better understand the entire ecosystem, the environment um, that leads to mistrust, that leads to individuals not participating in research and addressing those issues through bioethics and LC work. And I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Collier. I appreciate that. Um, I now invite Dr. Yates to give his remarks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, hold on while I'm loading my slides. I thought I had to. Yeah. All right, so, so thank you um, for um, inviting me and I'm, it's my pleasure to you know, share with you um, some of what we've been thinking about at, um, you know, from a basic science perspective. I, I think uh, uh, Ms. Collier gave a wonderful sort of backdrop and opening to what we struggle with as basic scientists every day and how do we fit into that landscape? And then not only how we fit into that landscape, but how are we changing that landscape and what can we do about it to make um, therapies as well as um, uh, clinical trials uh, more equitable. And so I'm gonna share with you a little bit of, of our basic science stories uh, today and um, how we sort of fit and move all the way up through ancestry and then um, hopefully how we see that we can fit into the clinical landscape and, and future clinical trials directed at people um, uh, 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 that have African ancestry. So um, I do, I am a consultant. I have, you know, a disclosure. I am a consultant advisor to Riptide Biosciences and I didn't put on there QED therapeutics as well. However, I will not dis discuss any development of investigational drugs in my presentation today. So when we talk about the scare disparities and again, you know, this was covered, but I always like to begin with this slide because it's really important. We can't do disparities research and isolate. Again, I'm, I'm gonna make a disclaimer. I'm a basic scientist. I'm gonna talk about some basic science in a second, but you know, doing that, we can't only do it through that lens. We have to really focus and understand where we fit into the, to the greater landscape. And so when we talk about, you know, disparities, there are multiple areas of focus 
particularly starting at the end, or well, I say at the end, but where we should start as far as our thinking is healthcare as well as, you know, increase in survival of patients, because those are usually the disparities that we're trying to eliminate. But when you break that down, there are many, many, many issues to tackle here. Race is a specific diversity. We have epidemiology, which is associated with a lack of awareness based on community, zip code, um, your anthropology. So we start to intertwine the differences between race and, and, and ethnicity as far as social constructs and how, you know, I used to argue before we started our ancestry, I think I could share that with this group, was that uh, when I was an African-American man, especially as I was a young professor, it was that it didn't matter what my ancestry was because as a black man, I'm always seen as a black man and treated as a black man. And so therefore that's what society perceives me as. So, you know, so therefore that has to influence my genetics or epigenetics at some level, right? And so, um, and again, we'll discuss that and you'll sort of see how my research sort of intertwines that uh, over, over uh, my career. But again, if you start to go back to that, again, we, you know, you're talking about exposures, right? And then you have baseline genetics and then obviously back to you know, um, healthcare and treatment. And we want to make sure that at each level that this is equitable, right? And that's the, and that's the goal. So you know, tonight we're talking about precision medicine. So I put this slide up here and you know, often people think uh, again, I, I, I firmly believe, and again, this is a, a, a not a Tuskegee disclaimer, but uh, a Clayton Yates disclaimer that uh, uh, President Obama uh, termed precision medicine and was really forcing precision medicine because it was really aimed at understanding how we uh, treat people of diverse backgrounds. Because if you kind of think about it, precision medicine is a personalized approach to medicine, right? It's more information about a person's genes, their proteins, their environment that are all bundled up together that are used to treat a disease instead of just coming into clinic and fitting into a box or a category. In the case of cancer, we're increasingly using genomics as a predominant, for, uh, a predominant factor in deciding the, the therapeutics and drugs uh, that a, a, a patient has available to them. Um, and then actually, as and, and more recently, as an environmental lifestyle and also are, are starting to be considered, but they haven't necessarily made it all the way into um, the clinical um, and, and, and into clinical regimens. Um, however, precision medicine, if we do it right, you know, aims to offer the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And I think Ms. Kari mentions that right at the end of her presentation. But in order for us to do that, we gotta identify the mutations or, or genes that are specifically associated with the right patients so we can target them at the right time and get them the right medicines, right? So when we start to talk about that, that, that sounds really great, right? So that, that sounds like, you know, ideal, but how do we get there? So, you know, the NCI took on what, we, what they call the NCI, uh, the National Cancer Institute Precision Medicine um, Act, which is uh, where, you know, th this, this was a goal to say, you know, uh, and, and it was 10,000 patients where they took the genome, they sequenced these 10,000 patients. And then they said, well, if we can look at the mutations that are associated with these patients, can we then match that with the appropriate therapy, right? So they call it the NCI match trial, right? So again, it's taking the genomic background of an, a, a person with various cancer types and then matching it with the appropriate drug, right? And so what came out of this, and there are a number of successes, but for, for today's conversation, what became very apparent was that not all patients here, I like to highlight this little area right here, you know, not all patients with tumors have a, have a, with, with, a, with an abnormal mu, a, a mutation actually had a matching drug, right? And so why is that the case, right? So we've been sequencing genomes for a long time and we can make drugs once we know the mutation it's, you know, that's pretty straightforward process to, to create therapeutics. So why is that the case that we don't have drugs to match the mutation that represents the population? And so if you start to look at that, that uh, 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 dig deeper into that, what is really apparent is that our DNA, this was, you know, taken from the Smithsonian, a, a, a really sort of late article. So if you have time, I, I implore you to read it. But what it says is that the DNA we have is just too, it's too white, right? So if you look over on the left side, um, and if you look at the G, genome wide association studies, and again, Ms. Carter talked about this, but if you even take this to not just GY, GY studies, but even genome, um, whole exome and whole genome studies, 
it's even lower, you can see majority of the information that we have today is on European ancestry um, populations and that we just don't have enough information in other ethnic groups to start to make those translation to really hold to the promise of what precision medicine should uh, be about. So, you know, so understanding that there's some genomic, you know, a lack of genomically uh, under uh, uh, issues, really early on before, you know, genomic and ancestry was really accessible and now it's, you know, quite affordable. And I'll talk about this in, in a second. Our lab, you know, took a, a more, a, a, a different approach. So, we, you know, we asked the question, well, you know, um, if, we, if we can't necessarily find genomic mutations right now, are there epigenetic? Are there changes in the epigenome that could, that, that could be contributing to the disparities? And so we looked at a particular type of epigenetic mutation called DNA methylation. That's what's shown here. And DNA methylation really quickly is the, um, the expression of uh, cytosines or guanosines right next to each other in, the, in your DNA. Um, we like DNA methylation because it's extremely targetable because it is reversible. Um, it's involved in cell differentiation, tumor, tumor genesis, and it's also linked to race and lifestyle. So that means you can influence your epigenome by how you live, by how you eat, and, and so forth. And so for the basic sciences on the, on, on, on the right side, I have a little bit of, so basic science is that these are cytosines and these are uh, guanosines. And these DNA methyl transferases actually categorize a methyl group on the DNA. And that actually causes the DNA to, if it's linear, where it can be open and you know, code for genes and transcriptions and so forth. It actually, when that methyl group goes in there, it actually binds to the DNA, causes it to wind up and coil, if you will. And therefore genes, and particularly in the gene of interest, gets turned off. So that's what we usually result as DNA methylation. So, you know, try to understand, again, DNA methylation is studied in many disease contexts in many labs. Our lab went to, wanted to go a little bit further and understand actually how that methylation machinery works. So we started to focus on a, a, a methyl binding protein called Kaizo, all right? So this methyl binding protein, so it's Kaizo is a bimodal transcription factor. And when I say bimodal, that means it can bind to DNA methylated groups but it can also be a transcription factor and bind to other regions in the genome and turn on and turn off genes like every other transcription factor, okay? Um, and at the time, you know, when we started this work, Kaizo had been known to shuttle in and out of the nucleus, and we thought this was something that could be really important in cancer. And so the sort of dogma, what, we, what, we, what we're uh, in the basic science area, and I do apologize for this, and, you know, we'll zoom out in a minute, um, but, but, but what we sort of understand as the function of these methyl binding protein is that DNA methylation occurs because of some methyl line, methyl, uh, um, lifestyle event and or some hereditary predisposition. And however, at some point, there's a methyl binding group that comes and binds and sits on those methyl groups in the DNA. And then that turns the genes off. And those usually in the case of cancer associated with tumor suppressor genes and so forth. And that promotes disease. So. Um, um, Jacqueline um, Jones Triss, who uh, was a graduate student in my lab and actually um, was now just the first tenure professor at Troy University. I'm so happy she texted me uh, this week. Um, and so, and that so tells you my age. When she was in the lab as a graduate student, she started to, to, to determine if Kaizo was really playing a role in prostate cancer development. And so what she looked at is, uh, these are histochemistry experiments where we're looking for a brown stain of Kaizo and normal adjacent normal BPH, low grade tumors and high tumors. And what we can find is that Kaizo is significantly expressed as tumors become more aggressive, as you can expect, we thought this was a great biomarker, but we also saw it shift from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And at the time, while, you know, again, being a minority, you know, being a minority scientist, we wanted to look and didn't have an idea of Kaizo's associated with African-American or disparities, but we had, we were conscious enough to start to see if we could separate out the patient population, was there any difference in, in gene expression? Um, and, and, and we did. So we, we found that Kaizo was significantly elevated in African-American men compared to Caucasian men. And so Jackie went on to show that this is not only occurs in prostate cancer, but also occurs in breast cancer patients. Again, this is a much larger cohort, over 600 patients. 
that she um, screened and what she saw very nicely was that if a patient here on, on, on B in the slide middle, um, if a patient has a Kaizo levels and it's varying levels of, you know, three were being high, one were being low, if that patient and or, or tumor metastasized or became more aggressive, it uniformly was had a high level of Kaizo expression here at, at, at three. And if you start to break that down by, at this time, we weren't using ancestry, we actually were using race, self-reported race in the, from the clinical, me clinical records. Um, um, that if you look at Caucasian women, primary tumors uh, have Kaizo and they have prepared met metastases are high. But if you look at African-American women, they had Kaizo levels equal to that of, of a metastases in Caucasian women, African-American women had the highest levels of Kaizo. And in collaboration with um, Julia Daniels at McMaster University, she went on to show that this not only occurs in African-American women, but it also occurs in native Nigerian and uh, women from Barbados who have even higher levels uh, of Kaizo. So now we're starting to see that this, act, this, this, this gene Kaizo that controls DNA methylation actually has some type of ancestral um, 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 relationship to its gene expression. And so we again went on to show that Kaizo is not only a biomarker, but it's actually functional. So there's a process in the cell called epithelial mesenchymal transition or what I have at the title called EMT here. And so what you see on the right is that cells that have high levels of Kaizo, they have this fibroblast shape. So what this shape does is it allows the cells to move and spread out throughout the body. And so if you deplete Kaizo, and this uh, over here on the left side, what you do is that that changes that shape, the, the migratory shape where they can move around a lot, they start to become connected and this, you know, has them less uh, migratory activity. And so we saw, we thought the Kaizo was really important because depleting Kaizo was able to change that more aggressive phenotype. And then we took that and looked at patient tumors that also held true. So ecadherin, which is again a marker of less aggressive cells, which is expressed in green here, um, blue is, is a nuclear stain and Kaizo is red, in cells, in tumors that were less aggressive, had high epithelial markers such as ecadherin, the Kaizo is very, very low, but in tumors here that have low ecadherin, Kaizo is really high and these are really aggressive um, um, patients that have worked outcomes. This is not only important as far as just the gene expression, we also saw that if you knock out Kaizo in, in mice, right, so that, you know, these mice form um, 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 much smaller tumors. This is done by um, Balu Karanam, who is actually a now a junior professor here. He was a postdoc at the time. And Dana Hardy, who's now actually a patent agent at the FDA, when they were in the lab, they showed that, you know, when depleting of Kaizo, you have much smaller tumors. But more importantly, you know, here, you know, this is, you know, this red expression when we, 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 we professionally label these, uh, 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 these tumors and when we inject them in the mice. But if you deplete Kaizo expression, we absolutely get zero metastasis. And we've done this in prostate and breast and even colorectal cancer. We see all the same thing. If, you do, if the tumors don't have any Kaizo, we do not see any metastasis, right? And so we thought this was really a, a really novel finding. And so to summarize almost 10 years worth of work, um, what we now know is that Kaizo is regulated as a clear promoter of aggressiveness of disease, particularly in African-Americans. It's regulated by multiple growth factors. Here's a, a schematic that we published um, last year in, in, in Biochem um, archives, where you know, Julia Daniels' group, who also works on Kaizo and McMaster, and in my group as well, we came together to sort of summarize our findings. And what, what this shows is that whether you have you know, a, a TJ beta growth factor, and in our case, we were looking at EGF receptor growth factor signaling, which we also know is important overexpressed in African-Americans. If a Kaizo becomes in, uh, um, largely expressed, if it translocates to the nucleus and turns off gene expression, tumors become more aggressive. And this is associated with a more aggressive phenotype in African-American patients. Again, we you know, showed this was very important, not only in, in breast cancer patients, um, we also published this in uh, a finding to show that um, uh, Kaizo has some gender specific roles as well in pancreatic um, um, ductal carcinoma. So in this case, interestingly, we saw that in women with low grade pancreatic tumors, Kaizo was actually high. But if the, if the tumor switched from low grade pancreatic tumors to more high grade, men, 
have actually higher levels of chizo. So that's what we see here. And in that, in those men that have that higher level of chizo, we saw more nuclear expression. And that nuclear expression was associated with a more inflammatory phenotype. So in this manuscript, we showed very through, uh, again, I'm, and I'm only giving you a, a summary because um, the data has been published several years now, um, is that when, you know, Kaizo binds and not only regulates these EMT genes that we showed before, but it regulates these inflammatory genes and these inflammatory genes could be some of the underlying reasons why we see men with more aggressive pancreatic disease um, than, than, than women. And so just to shift a little, uh, a, a little bit. So as we, we were doing the, the, the Kaiser work and we, again, you know, this was before the age of genomics and we were still in microarrays land and, you know, we didn't have really ex accessible, we were thinking about disparities in that way. Simultaneously, people were starting to understand that disparity was really important and starting to do directed studies toward that. And one of my um, mentors and actually colleagues, Isaac Powell at Wayne State was one of the four thought, uh, foremost leaders in this area, particularly in prostate cancer. And so, uh, uh, I, uh, 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 Dr. Powell did, you know, what was at the time one of the largest differentially expressed, you know, uh, um, 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 studies looking at prostate cancer in African American men as well as Caucasian. And he did at the time again a 500 gene microarray. Now, you, we, now again, that was very lot, uh, uh, a lot of genes, but you know, at the, but we also looked in almost six 650 patients, right? And so what um, Dr. Powell found was that if you start to look at gene expression differences in African-American men, similar stage match with Gleason grade, et cetera, right? Similar stage match for aggressiveness. You start to see clear gene differences, okay? And this is a busy slide. I'm gonna expand it in, in the next slide in a bit. But what, what he saw was that, if you start to look here, one of the major, major genes called ERG, this is actually regulated by Tipper's ERG. ERG was largely decreased in African-American and significantly higher in, in, in Caucasians. Now, again, this has now been replicated by my lab and so many other labs, and this is really true and very solid. But not only did uh, Ike Powell show that ERG expression was down, he also saw that these African-American men had an increase in these inflammatory type genes. Now, again, this is really important because we talked about the, the role of Kaizo earlier in our pancreatic tumors. So, you know, IL-1B, IL-6, IL-A, all of these interleukin chemokines that we know associated with aversive inflammatory response were chronically elevated in African-American men. So, you know, I called this up when he published his paper and he said, Clay, you know, you know, we, we, we did just this initial analysis. Um, how about, can, can, can you look at our data further and see if you can draw anything else out of it? So center around the ERG, uh, uh, the ERG status, because ERG seems to be a actually major player as far as tumor genesis in, in, in prostate tumors. Jason White, um, who is a graduating PhD student in the lab, but he finished his thesis this year, as well as Honky Wong, who's now an associate professor, they came together and, they, and with I, I, I Powell's data. And what we did was we wanted to stratify this ERG expression because ERG seemed to be associated with this inflammatory response. And look how if a patient had a low ERG, which is here on the left at this bar and with a high ERG expression, which is here on the right. And if a patient was European American and African American, how did that correlate with their inflammatory gene signature, right? And so that would really tell the test if this was really like anything, anything correlative. And what you can see is that patients here with low ERG expression, particularly African American have the high inflammatory gene expression. But if that, if that ERG expression shifts over even from mid, which is in the middle, over to high, that actually shifts the inflammatory signature as well. So ERG started to become a major, major player. And again, many labs now have uh, corroborated these findings, but it also had, had us summarize that African-American tumors appeared to be utilizing different pathways to aggressiveness. So, you know, while an ERG positive tumor is more associated with a Caucasian, an ERG negative patient, here when we say an, an ERG negative patient, would have a progression of disease to a more stem-like phenotype. That stem-like phenotype is associated with more chronic pump, uh, inflammation, increasing IL-6, and that's leading to a prostate cancer in African-American men, which we don't see more, more, uh, a lot in, 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 in Caucasian men. So, so, you know, when we started to understand, okay, this inflammation seems to be a reoccurring thing, right? This inflammation, 
uh, we know are, is, is a driver of disease. While inflammation is really good to sound the alarm for your body to attack, you know, disease and so forth, chronic inflammation is not, is really bad. So we started, we wanted to tease out the source of that. So, you know, my lab some time ago established um, one of the now most utilized in, in um, prostate cancer models for African-American men cell culture models so that we could study disease in the lab, right? Through, through cell culture. And so we call these the RC cells. And so what we did is that we did whole transcriptome sequencing on these cells. And we wanted to look at what were the most differentially expressed genes. And so what these bubbles are, these little bubbles here, these bubbles are gene expression gene sets. And what we saw is that in these gene sets, in these are cells, that means there's no tumor microenvironment, no immune cells. The major pathways that were increased compared to Caucasian cell lines were cytokines, immune signature genes, and so forth. So we also compared that to tumor cells where we actually microdissected. So we took tumors, you know, and that have an entire tumor microenvironment. We actually only actually macro dissected out the tumor cells, and then we actually genome sequence, uh, RNA sequence these patients as well. And we saw that similar pattern that we see in our cell lines. So basically what we're seeing here, or our conclusion was that this inflammatory gene signature was not just from the tumor microenvironment or from immune cells, it's actually coming from the cancer cells themselves, <laughs> right? Um, and so we wanted to explore that further. So some of my colleagues, Renee Reams at Florida A&M was one of the first um, to show that you know, African-Americans had this inflammatory gene signature uh, in a pilot microRNA studies. And a colleague of mine, um, Stefan Arms, who is at NCI, that we're now working with on one of the you know, largest genome sequencing projects uh, um, to date. Um, it's, a, it's a DOD impact study. But what Stefan showed almost right after what R R Renee Reem showed was that some of the most major differences that we see in African-American men are related to immune system, right? And that these immune system differences appear to be drivers of, uh, of disease in African-American patients. And so what Stefan went on to show is that there, this can actually be kind of categorized into actually a group of genes. And he's calling this group of genes this interferon DNA damage related resistance gene signature. And this gene signature is highly upregulated in African-American men. You can see here, he had multiple publications on this by showing that it occurs almost 67% in African-Americans, whereas we only see it 33%. Now, I will say if an African-American patient has this DNA damage re re repair gene signature, the outcomes are almost very similar to European-American patients, but we see it more frequently in African-Americans. And this 47 gene signature appears to be a driver of disease. And if you look at the 47 gene disease signature across its context as far as outcome and survival, what you see here is a, on the left is a heat map um, of the 47 gene signature. And you can see, again, it's associated on this left, far left, associated with, again, high disease. And again, the, uh, on the right side, these patients also have a, a, a worse outcome in survival. And so we start to look at you know, this inflammatory gene signature and inflammation. What is inflammation? What is driving inflammation? What cell types are important? So, you know, there's a paper that came out um, actually last year in Frontiers Oncology that sort of summarized a lot of what we've been seeing. And this is in breast cancer, but it also holds true in prostate cancer. And I'll show you some data in a minute that hopefully you'll agree supports this. Is that we, when we, ooh, sorry, when we start to see patients from Africa with African ancestry, we see this increase in, in IL-6. Remember, I showed you from the Ike Powell data. IL-1B, this inflammatory gene seeing CRP, creative resistant protein. And this these increase in inflammatory gene signature is also associated with a complete sort of shift in the immune cell phenotype. And this immune cell, and while going into the individual cells, this chronic inflammatory gene signature or cytokines create this suppressive environment in African-Americans that we really just don't see in European Americans. And this more suppressive environment is associated with a, a, with, a, with a worse outcome, okay? And so when we look back in our gene signature, and again, we you know looked at the immune cell populations in our African-American versus Caucasian, we saw the same thing. And if we break these down by race, and this is now where we start to bring ancestry in. So what we decided to do now, because these ancestry tools are really available, you can take genome sequencing data and we can run ancestry based on you know, thousand genomes. 
ancestry sub subpopulation sets, and we go back and look at our patients, we can start to say, okay, if this patient is what percent African ancestry versus an admixed population versus European ancestry, and how does that relate to their gene signature, right? And again, we see that whole truth that these African American patients that are, have at least more than 70% West African ancestry have this more suppressive immune gene signature. So, you know, again, simultaneously, you know, you know we all have multiple projects in the lab um, in collaboration with Wendy Dean Cologne. Um, at, at, at Tulane University, we were starting to say, okay, we saw this in prostate cancer. We saw this phenotype associated with androgen receptor negative phenotype. How about breast cancer? Can we separate this in breast cancer patients as, as well? So we started to look at breast cancer patients that have ADR positive versus ADR negative phenotype. And what we can see here is that African-American women, unsurprisingly, have lower AR negative expression uh, have more AR negative uh, tumors than AR positive cells um, 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 patients. Um, if we start to look at tri tri uh, tri um, tri triple negative prostate cancer, which we know is one of the most of aggressive forms of breast cancer, actually 78% of triple negative are actually AR negative. And these AR negative patients have higher tumor recurrence and or metastases. Um, and if we start to break down the genotype and or phenotype of these patients that have these AR negative, we actually now categorize these patients now as quadruple negative. So we actually named a new subtype of, uh, of breast cancer now from triple negative to a quadruple negative. And AR interceptor is the fourth hormone. What we start to see is that these African-American women who have AR negative, triple negative tumors have a more basal immunophenotype as we saw in the prostate cancer patients that we don't see in our European ancestry patients as well, okay? And if we use African ancestry, we, we actually just published this um, um, last year where we use admixture on these patients. Again, we use, you know, here is the African ancestry uh, in, um, in, in pink and the European ancestry is actually in blue. We, and if you use, um, you know, 70% ancestry as a cutoff and we start to look at differentially gene expression, uh, and you overlay that by self-reported race, it's some really interesting findings, right? So as you can expect, African-American women have differentially expressed gene expression, that's here in blue, and self-reported Caucasian women have differentially gene expression. But if you overlay these, the, 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 the um, ancestry, right, the ancestry genes into the self-reported race, what we see here is that these European women who self-report as race actually have a subset of, of African, that, that actually have higher African ancestry, share more African American associated or African ancestry associated gene expression. And if you do follow genetic trees by that, you can actually trace the lineage of those ancestry related genes in those individual patient populations, right? So it, we thought this was super cool, sorry. Okay, yeah, um, so right, I, I, I right. wanted to, right. yes. Nearing time, time and to so just to, wrap up. <laughs> so, so, so just to finish up, We've gone on to show that this is not only associated with ancestry, but is also associated with uh, Kaizo expression. And just to bring it back home, Kaizo seems to be a, a regulator of this. this. is an ancestry gene that be, seems to be regulating these ancestry immune populations. And that, um, I'll, I'll just skip the last few slides here. Uh, I think I do want to highlight an article that we just uh, got accepted in Nature Communications and was published uh, on February 1st, where we showed very nicely that uh, if you look at Kaizo expression uh, in relation to immune cell population, as far as distance, um, you can see that African-Americans here based on ancestry have higher levels of Kaizo, but we also see not only do we have higher levels, but the immune immunosuppressive immune genes are actually in more closer proximity as far as distance to the actual tumor cell in an African-American patient than a Caucasian patient. So that means that immunosuppressive immune cell is closer providing a suppressive environment or growth factor uh, enriching um, environment for the African-American patient that is not occurring in Caucasian. And this has real life, real world instances because a number of these immunosuppressive immune checkpoints are in clinical trials. And so therefore understanding that we feel like African-Americans could benefit from these immune checkpoint therapies and then easily translate this into clinic. And so again, um, thank you for your time. This work cannot be done without a whole host of collaborations and a lot of grant support from the Department of Defense and NIH. 
and I like to say diversity starts in the lab. And so we have a diverse lab. And so diverse thinking is uh, what we foster. And, the, and that's the group on the right who actually does the work. I just get to talk about it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Yates and Ms. Collier for your, your presentations. We have just a minute or two for, for questions. And I, I'm going to ask one question. I, I had one question each for, for, for Ms. Collier and, and Dr. Yates, which I'll, I, I'm going to try to ask. But there's, there's one question from a, from a participant. Can you define race versus ethnicity? versus ancestry. We use these terms a lot and almost interchangeably. And this person says, which is it that genetic counselors really mean when they're asking about membership in populations with higher incidences? And I would broaden this to say, what is it that anybody really means? I mean, you know, there's some of us doing studies to understand, trying to understand what the general public thinks, as well as what physicians and, and researchers think. So, and either of you want to take a stab at that million dollar question. Sure, I can start. I, I think there was a time when I thought I actually understood the difference, right? <laughs> Terms are often conflated. I provided a presentation once to a group of geneticists and we were talking about diversity in Africa. And I talked about the ethnic groups in Africa and, and whether we could possibly, possibly move towards using ethnic labels to better define groups. And one of the um, persons, one of the attendees said, even within those ethnic groups, there's going to be genetic ancestry that might be surprising to us. So where you might, where someone might identify personally and socially with a particular ethnic group, but genetics may show that they have ancestors that they did not know about. And so I think it's a, it's a challenge for the field to use these terms in clear, and consistent ways. And that, that may remain an ongoing challenge. And uh, so we have to continue, we should continue the discussion to think about what are some of the best ways to describe the differences and importantly, biological differences if that's what we're after. Race and ethnicity capture social differences. Good point. The, the, one great point you make there, made there, Shaniqua, is what we're after. Right, and, and needing to be specific about what, about what we're trying to find out. And the label, not just the label, what we're actually looking at represents, must represent what it is we're trying to find. Dr. Yates. Well, again, I, I do feel is what you're looking for and then also in what context and what setting. So, you know, if I'm speaking to a more general audience, I actually use them interchangeably, probably incorrectly, but I do. <laughs> But, but as we, as biologists, so I can tell you, you know, and, and, and this may be a little bit more information than you want to know. So as a basic science, we were challenged as whether genetics or genomics or ancestry was really real, right? And so we've been challenged to actually define that better in our basic science and why we actually quantify ancestry now before we even start to say is the disparity and we can quantify the amount of ancestry and that's almost a precursor to, you know, initiating, you know, starting our study. So when I use it in a biological context, or we want to use it, in, in, in my opinion, to as a translational, you know, to actually enter at one point the clinical con, uh, care con, um, um, paradigm, we have to quantify that, right? Because you have to know, you know, if a drug is going to respond in a certain patient with a certain genomic and genetic background, and if those genes are different or expressed or not. So. You know, it, it, I think it does matter, and I don't know what fields have caught up with which, but it also depends on what we're after. I, I have to agree with, with Ms. Collier as well. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both. Um, I think I need to turn over. I had a question for each of you that was going to be my wrap-up question, but at this point, I think I need to turn over to Susan for her to, to, to wrap it up, because I know we are past time. Yes, and I know that there were a lot of questions. Um, I, I really thank the speakers. Uh, this has been fascinating tonight, and I'm sorry that we're not going to get to all of these questions. I, I really uh, hope that you all will join us again next week um, on Tuesday, February 16th. But um, I think that this has been a fascinating discussion, and we can continue this, and that's why we wanted to have two webinars. So um, we do have to wrap up now, but 
Um, thank you so much. Thank you all of the speakers, uh, Dr. Royal, Dr. Yates, Dr. Callier. Um, this was a lot of information and it was really um, superbly presented. So thank you to each of you. We will be sending attendees a survey um, and hope that you will um, complete the survey. That really does give us information for planning future ones. And we will have categories in there because we don't know how else to, to do that right now. Um, but there also, I will tell you, there will be a recording of this that will be available and on our um, Baylor College of Medicine.edu evening genetics um, website, and we will um, have this, the recording available. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Royal, yeah. Dr. Callier, Dr. Yates, very much um, appreciate the time that you've spent and all of this information. This is fantastic. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone, and good night. Good night. Good night.